The journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. That's Lao Tzu, a Chinese philosopher. By the way, we're off-world duo. My name is Joey. With me is my brother Jesse. Howdy. Uh, I'm going to be reading uh, some fun facts of the Wild West. Apparently, camels once roamed the Texas Plains. In 1856, the U.S. Camel Corps was an experiment by the U.S. Army. They suggested using camels as pack animals in the Southwest, which the Army declined. Shortly after the Civil War started, the experiment was abandoned, and any and all camels were sold at auctions. The California Gold Rush wasn't the first in America. 1799 in Cabarrus County, North Carolina, a young boy found a gold nugget while fishing on his property. When he showed his father, they were unsure as to what it was. It wasn't until a few years later that he took it to a jeweler. After he sold it, he learned its true value and began searching for more gold on his property, successfully finding more pieces. The second major gold rush was in Georgia in 1828. It's unclear as to who made the first discovery, but many claim are but many claims came from northern Georgia and soon many philosophers were flocking to find the gold. Eventually, in the east, in White County, more gold was being found in the creeks and rivers. Let me start over. The famous California gold rush occurred in 1848 at Sutter's Mill. James Wilson Marshall was constructing a sawmill along the American River when he found gold. Although he discovered it in January, no one believed the account at first. It wasn't until May of 1848 when a storekeeper brandished bottles with gold dust that thousands made their way to California to get their gold. The oldest settlement in the U.S. is Acoma Pueblo. Huh, I think I've heard of this place. Jamestown was settled in 1607, but... Acoma Pueblo in New Mexico has been established since 1150 AD, making it the oldest community in North America that has been continuously inhabited. It is a federally recognized Indian tribe, home to 4,800 tribal members, and is known as their Sky City. A man named Elmer McCurdy's body traveled more in death than in life. Okay, Elmer McCurdy. Never heard of him. Let's see. Shot by Sheriff's Posse in Osage Hills on October 7th, 1911. Returned to Guthrie, Oklahoma from Los Angeles County, California. Hmm. During his first train robbery, Elmer Elmer McCurdy only escaped with less than $500, causing his partners to drop him. After finding another group to run with, he was shot dead during another robbery. No one claimed the body, so the funeral homeowner decided to claim him, embalm the body, and turn him into a display piece. Huh. In 1916, someone Im impersonating a relative of McCurdy's was able to take the body and put it on display. This started the journey his body took, being passed from shows to car act to carnivals. Damn. After enough moving around, people seemed to forget that this was the real body of Elmer McCurdy and not a prop. It wasn't until December of 1976, during an episode of 
or an episode shoot of the six million dollar man that people discovered it was a real body. Wow. The body was finally laid to rest in April of 1977. The famous OK Corral shootout wasn't much of a shootout. Oh. Hmm. The well-known shootout occurred between the Earp brothers, Morgan, Virgil, Wyatt, Doc Holliday, Billy Claiborne, Billy and Ike Clanton, and Frank and Tom McClary. It has been discovered that this major shootout only lasted 30 seconds, and it wasn't at the OK Corral at all. But it was close. The gunfight occurred near the intersection of 3rd Street and Fremont Street in Tombstone, Arizona. Okay. So that's why the movie's called Tombstone. Although there still was a lot of bloodshed and three as three lawmen were injured and three cowboys were killed. Thanks to a Winchester rifle, we know Billy the Kid wasn't left-handed. Hmm. Okay. A famous tin type photograph of Billy the Kid shows him with a gun with a gun belt on his left side. For years, the portrait fueled assumptions that the outlaw born William Bonney was left handed. However, most tin type cameras produced a negative image that appeared positive once it was developed, meaning the end result was the, re was the reverse of reality. There's another reason we know the picture was a mirror image and that Billy the Kid was thus a righty. He, pose he poses with his Winchester model 1873 lever action rifle. The weapon appears to feature a long or a loading gate on the left side, but Winchester only made 1873s that load on the right. The Long Branch Saloon of Gunsmoke fame really did exist in Dodge City and still does, sort of. Anyone who watched the television show Gunsmoke growing up is well acquainted with Miss Kitty's Long Branch Saloon of Dodge City, Kansas. What viewers may not have realized is that the Long Branch really d did exist. No one knows exactly what year it was established, but the original saloon burned down in the Great Front Street Fire of 1885. The saloon was later resurrected and now serves as a tourist attraction featuring a reproduction bar with live entertainment. According to the Boot Hill Museum, the original Long Branch Saloon served milk, tea, lemonade, uh, sars uh, sarsaparilla, I don't know what that is, alcohol and beer. One pivotal Civil War, ba Civil War battle was fought in an unlikely place, New Mexico. In a bold move designed to fill rebel coffers with Cripple Creek gold, Confederate General Henry Hopkins Sibley invaded New Mexico territory from the south in early 1862. Believing he could march right up to the Rio Grande and take Colorado. Unbeknownst to Sibley, however, the 1st Regiment volunteers in Colorado caught wind of the scheme and marched 400 miles south in just 13 days to join the Yankees at Fort Union. Near Santa Fe, instead of a cakewalk, Sibley's forces wound up fighting what, what many historians call the Gettysburg of the West. After just two days of skirmishing, Union troops, probably relying on local ranchers as guides, outflanked the Confederates and burned their supply train. After that, it was a long, slow march back to Texas for the rebels, who never returned. The first film cowboy wasn't a cowboy at all. Widely credited with inventing the Western film genre, Bronco Billy Anderson, star of the 1903's The 
the great train robbery was born Maxwell Henry Henry Aronson in 1880, the son of a traveling Arkansas salesman. As soon as Aronson was old enough, he hightailed it to New York City, where he produced or acted in literally hundreds of films cast somewhat by chance in the great train robbery. Aronson decided to capitalize on its success by creating the Bronco Billy persona. Aronson ended up with ended up writing and starring in dozens of short western films, becoming the first cowboy matinee idol, uh, the ca first cowboy matinee idol. Jesse James was larger than life so much that his body required two graves. Few outlaws were as notorious during their own lifetimes as Jesse James, though he lived a quiet existence in Gurney, Missouri, after his bank robbing days were over, old friends and enemies never forgot him. After Jesse was murdered, he was buried in the front yard of his farm to thwart grave robbers. As the years passed and his enemies died off, he was reinterred in a Gurney cemetery by his family. So who's that lying in the Jesse James grave in Granbury, Texas? A man named James, or a man named J. Frank Dalton, who came forward around 1948 at age 101, claiming he was the real Jesse James. A court even allowed him to legally adopt the bandit's name. No one knows why Dalton made this claim, or if he ever had any link to Jesse James, regardless. Uh, mit mitochondrial DNA showed decades later that James is indeed buried in Mount Olivet Cemetery in Kearney, or Kearney, or however you pronounce that. But this legend also lives on in Granbury. It says, Holy Man slash Tribal Chief. Sitting Bull was a tribal chief of the Hunk Papa. Lakota Sal tribe. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Unk Papa Lakota Sal tribe. Because of his defiance against the U.S. government, he became symbolic of the struggles between the government and the natives. In 1876, he and his people were able to defeat General Custer's army in the Battle of the of the Little Bighorn. Finally surrendering in 1881, he joined Buffalo Bill's Wild West show. In December of 1890, he was shot by police in an arrest attempt prompted by Indian agents who feared he would try to escape. Native American leader Geronimo, was, who was fought against Mexico and the U.S. in their effort to expand the Apache tribal lands in what is now Arizona. He led several raids against both of them after his wife and children were killed by Mexican troops in the 1850s. He was given his name for his bravery in battle where he killed several Mexicans with a knife amid flying bullets. Settlers believed he was the worst Indian who ever lived. Damn. He must have been throwing knives like a son of a bitch, man. Yeah. Jeez. Whew. Settlers believed he was the worst Indian who ever lived? But after his surrender to U.S. troops in 1886, he co converted to Christianity and even rode in Teddy Roosevelt's inaugural parade. He either is really stealthy, or he was throwing knives. Hmm. Or he was just getting shot and he wasn't dying, and he just kept ru running up to people, stabbing him. Yeah. Which I doubt, but that would have been kind of funny. But did it have something to do with uh, that 
peyote or whatever. Was he high on peyote or whatever? Peyote? Be- no. Peyote or whatever, I don't whatever it's called. He could have been on <laughs> some high or something. I don't know. Because of the movie named after them, Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid are frequently mentioned together. But it was actually Cassidy who founded the gang known as the Wild Bunch, of which the Sundance Kid was a member, alongside Gunslinger's Kid Curry and the Tall Texan. Buffalo Bill had had a storied career, starting out as a writer for the Pony Express before he became an army scout and bison hunter. Bill recognized the amount of interest people had in life on the frontier and capitalized on it by founding Buffalo Bill's Wild West show. As the company grew, he toured all he toured all over the US before going over to Europe as well. Oh, I didn't know he went to Europe. I thought he Wow. I thought it was just exclusively in the in the United States. There were many famous outlaws in the Wild West, but perhaps none more so than Jesse James. Well, of course. But did you know that the that he was frequently accompanied in his exploits by his brother Frank James? He began their criminal, or they began their criminal careers as bushwhackers during the Civil War, and moved on to running their own gang of outlaws. They robbed banks, trains, and stagecoaches until Jesse James was killed by Robert Ford, one of his own gang members. The Spanish Territory. In addition to the Louisiana Purchase, Jefferson also wanted to claim Spanish Florida. Oh! You little... What the heck? Oh. thing fucked me. Yeah, he gave you, he gave you a check. Just checking. I didn't do anything. He didn't like your hat. Anyway, the Spanish territory. In addition to the Louisiana Purchase, Jefferson wanted to claim Spanish Florida. In 1819, the Addis Onis Treaty of the Transcontinental Treaty gave up Spanish control of Florida to the U.S. and set a bounty between the U.S. and New Spain. The treaty lasted for just about half a year, at which point Spain signed a treaty granting independence to Mexico, the Transcontinental Treaty, then defined the border between Mexico and the U.S. When the newly independent Mexico temporarily suspended U.S. immigration to Texas in 1830, the people started pushing for the independence of Texas. Once that happened, they were eligible to join the United States, and finally did in 1844. The term Manifest Destiny was coined in 1845, when it was published in a summer issue of the Democratic Review. It described the philosophy that was behind the push for expansion into the West, and particularly the Oregon Territory. It held that the U.S. was destined by God to expand their territory and to bring democracy and capitalism to the entire continent. Once the Oregon Territory was settled, President Polk was anxious to acquire California from Mexico. President Polk. Never heard of him. This led to the Mexican-American War, which ended with the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. Is it Hidalgo? Hidalgo, yeah. The treaty granted the U.S. 525,000 miles of territory, including what is now Arizona, Colorado, New Mexico, Nevada, Utah, and Wyoming. Pioneers who were settling the West were faced with harsh conditions as well as violent, or as well as the violence that occurred as they Force Native Americans from their lands. This led to a breakdown in law and order and an everyday struggle for survival. The Indian Wars, which were the result of increasing tensions between the natives and the settlers, made the West a dangerous place to be. Well, I'd, I'd say so, yeah. 
Because of the dangerous climate of the West, the settlers had to come up with a way to protect themselves, and many took up the right to bear arms in order to defend themselves, as they should. St. Elmo's Fire, or Foxfire, is a phosphorescent light which was often seen on the tips of cattle's horns, and occasionally on a horse's ears. It usually occurred on stormy nights or when there was electricity in the air. When the storm is fully charged, leaves, blades of grass, and the horns of cattle glow at their tips. In the time of the Wild West, convincing the people of an outlaw's death could be a challenge, so it became a custom to photograph the body. And that reminds me of in this game where you have to photograph the those famous outlaws bodies or yeah. that writer yeah oh sh it became yeah it became custom to photograph the body outlaws were often posed upright against a wall and photographed as quickly as possible before they stiffened up the photographs were also necessary to be used as proof for collecting rewards basically if there was no picture there was no guarantee the outlaw was dead it says here, despite what the movies might suggest, as many as one in four cowboys were black. Worked on ranches, tamed horses, and even appeared in rodeos. Somewhere between 5,000 and 8,000 black, cow black cowboys are estimated to have been part of the cattle drives of the 19th century. Some were slaves brought to the west by their white owners but many continued in the trade after emancipation. It's called the Wild West for a reason and there's nowhere to and there's nowhere that name was em, embodied more than it was in Fort Griffin, Texas. The town was built at the intersection of the West Fork or the Trinity River and the Clear Fork of the Brazos River in north part in the north part of Texas. The fort was built on a hill overlooking the Brazos River and was originally designed to pro protect the ranchers and farmers who lived in the settlement below. The town quickly became a popular st stopover for cowboys and outlaws. And by 1870, skirmishes, skirmishes with the Indians in the north were taking up most of their foes. And law enforcement became almost non-existent. As a result, the town got even rougher, with the likes of Big Nose Kate, Doc Holliday, and Wyatt Earp passing through. I don't know, what do you think? Do you think... What do you think the ratio was between women being prostitutes and just being wives? You think there were more wives than prostitutes? I don't know, man. Oh, you know what? I think there were. I think there were more uh, wives than prostitutes because, you know... You know, I'd like to think that. I guess you see those Wild West movies and you see those brothels just filled yeah. to the brim with with these prostitutes or they could be gunslingers too like Annie, Annie Oakley yeah yeah Annie Oakley I wish I think she was a rare type of woman though well, back in the day well I think she taught women even to snipe uh, at, at one point in her life so I'm pretty sure there was women who could uh, well it was a great equalizer for women to be able to shoot a gun yeah but uh, I saw a video are some footage of, of some real old footage of I think it was her she had a rifle and she was shooting coins out of the air it was wow yeah. okay well we made it let's let's have another one more fact and then we'll wrap it up here Western bar in the Wild West pub bar high pub bar hybrids called saloons popped up pretty much anywhere there was a settlement they were a place for cowboys, trappers, miners, lawmen, and even gamblers to come in for some food and drink, and maybe a game of cards. 
unlike the popular image of the saloon with the swinging wooden doors and the hitching post out front, the original saloons were little more than tents or shacks. As they as the town grew, the saloons became more permanent structures growing similar to that to what is pictured in movies and TV. Um, yeah. Interesting. Okay, that'll do it. Uh thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this video, like, subscribe with notifications, and we'll catch y'all later.